And then he'd say, well, but on the other hand... My attorney said it was the government. There was no doubt that it was the government. But what they were looking for, I don't know. What they thought I was doing, I don't know. I don't even know if it was the government. Maybe it was the thugs next door. Maybe it was the FBI. Or even maybe, most horrifying of all, he might have done it himself. Mental imbalance. Uh, he loved it. Uh, and he played with it. I mean, that's... That's the best thing to do with it. Um, if you're going to have, uh, if you've got a sort of paranoid side to you, best use it to write thrillers. Objects are sinister, he thought and sometimes seem to possess a will of their own. Suddenly, the towel wrapped itself around his wrist, yanking him against the wall. Rough cloth pressed over his nose and mouth. He fought wildly, pulling away. All at once, the towel let go. He fell to the floor in violent pain. He looked up at the towel rack. Three towels, all in a row. All exactly alike. All unmoving. Had he dreamed it? His belt got him around the waist and tried to crush him. I remember one time my fear of the police was so great that whenever I saw a, a parked police car and I was driving along, I would ask my wife to stop our car and I would surrender to the police on the spot <laughs> to whatever, whatever crime they wanted to accuse me of. And I merely took their advice. I left the United States and went to Canada for a while. Well, he had, uh, at this point, gone up to Canada to be guest of honor at some convention. And when the convention was over, he just chose to stay because he really had nothing to go home to at that point. His place had been blown up. Various people had said they'd shoot him if they saw him again. Um, and so he simply sort of jumped ship and stayed in Canada. And then got depressed, tried to kill himself, uh, checked into a heroin rehabilitation place, not because he was on heroin, but just because he wanted to be somewhere where they'd keep an eye on him. And eventually he moved down here, and uh, I think I was expecting sort of a raggedy fugitive, mm -hmm. which in fact is how he looked at the airport. He was smiling and real cheerful, but his coat was too small for him now because he'd been doing all kinds of exercise at the heroin place and his suitcase was tied shut with an extension wire and he was carrying a Jehovah Witness Bible, he said, to mollify the customs people. And he was real desperate, real end of the rope smile. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, this guy... Uh, being a science fiction writer doesn't <laughs> look like such a prosperous job to me. Bill, do me. Imitate my voice. How can I? You're not dead yet. I wish I could come out, Edie. I wish I could be born like everyone else. Can't I be born later on? I was wrong, Bill. I thought the doctor could cut a little round hole, and that would do it. Don't feel bad. I'll keep telling you how things are. When we met, I was 18 and he was 42. When we got married, he had turned 43, but I wasn't 19 yet. Almost. I didn't like to stay in a lot. But sometimes Phil couldn't go out. He suffered from agoraphobia, and it wasn't really well understood at the time. So he would tell people he had the flu all the time. But what it really meant was he couldn't leave the house. He was terrified. And if he forced himself to go out, let's say to go down one block and drop a letter in the mailbox, Sometimes he couldn't make it all the way down to the mailbox and he'd have to run back home. And at one point it got so bad that for three months he couldn't leave the bedroom. 
he was really bad off. And then he'd go through short periods when he simply stayed in bed all the time and nothing much happened except maybe a few visions. When he started hearing a female voice talking to him in his dreams, he assumed it was somehow connected with the loss of his sister. My search kept me at home. I sat before the TV set in my living room. I sat, I waited, I watched, I kept myself awake. This is Faye Weldon, and this is God, apparently, at the bottom of a spray can. The spray can is marked PKD, Philip K. Dick. It's quite safe if you use as directed, but the only problem is there's no one anymore to direct us. I am on one of the most important quests a human being can undertake. It is nothing less than an updating of the concept of divinity. I'm looking for clues to an invisible being of great size, whose outline is dim, but to me, real. It hides itself and has the ability to delude. There's no reason to suppose that it mimics humans, but rather inanimate objects. worried about spiritual matters. He was worried because I wasn't baptized. So I went to a Baptist church and got dunked that Sunday. But that still left our son. Christopher's favorite meal for lunch was a hot dog and Ovaltine. Phil put the hot dog aside because meat wouldn't be appropriate for a baptism. Dipped his finger in the Ovaltine and drew a cross on Chris's forehead with it. And then he gave him a bite of the hot dog bun and a drink of the Ovaltine. So it was, Chris then had his baptism and first communion and that kind of made him a member of the church and safe from demons. What happened to Philip K. Dick in February and March 1974 defies easy summation, but the sum total was that Philip K. Dick felt he had been perhaps contacted by something higher, something that could make reality cohere for him. V-A-L-I-S means vast active living intelligence system, and uh, that was his name, or one of his names, for that which he felt had contacted him. It led him to produce a very, very brilliant novel, Vallis. You can see it as an account of what spiritual chaos is in our day and age. Horse lover Fat told us that God had fired a beam of pink light at him. Horse lover Fat was actually in search of the dead girl Gloria, for whose death he considered himself responsible. He had totally blended his religious life and goals with his emotional life and goals. For him, savior stood for lost friend. Horse Lover Fat is a name that derives from uh, Philip K. Dick's analysis of his own name. Philip, apparently from the Greek lover of horses, and Dick, the German word for fat. You can find in Vallis that the dialogues between Horse Lover Fat and Phil, the two aspects of himself, are a brilliant self-examination and a kind of satiric uh, spoof of his own beliefs. I love the bravery of Vallis, uh, of, the, of the way he's willing to make fun of himself. Some of the things are from Phil's life, uh, and some of the things are from Phil's, uh, the lies that he presents 